Hey all, I thought I'd make it a professional conference and have music fading us in. Unfortunately though, what's really weird is I can't seem to comment. When I go in the chat, it won't let me respond to the chat. So I have absolutely no idea what's going on. So I can't, I can, everybody else seems to be able to chat. So that's perfect. So um, welcome everybody. Um, where are we? We're one minute past. I'm just gonna give us, a, actually we're on 120 people already. So we're doing pretty well. Um, I think I'm actually gonna just get going on the basis that we have 120 people and we have a lot to cover. Um, and for those of you who have probably figured out I come from South Africa, which is why I like Toto Africa, which I managed to get a clinical document world to play. So welcome to the TMF reference model meeting. Um, we are recording by the way, just so everybody knows, um, but the recording obviously is then put up um, so that you can get hold of it. Um, so today's the plan for today, we are going to quick introduction, then we're going to have Joanne Malia talk about reference model 321. Um, Joanne, I'm just going to check that you are on. Um, yes, you are. Excellent. Wonderful. Um, then we're going to go and talk about um, MHRA and the BMO report. And Kathy's going to give us a, an in-depth um, look at the MHRA GCP inspection report. I've said it's, it's quite an interesting report. Um, and we're going to have a few polls. Then we're going to have a, just a tiny bit from me on the BMO report. Um, I think the MHRA one's more interesting, really. And then we're going to hear a lot about the progress of the exchange mechanism survey from Ken and Elvin and Paul, upcoming meetings and the next meeting. So without further ado, let me progress. So just as a quick update for anybody who has, is new to this, and if you're new, um, oh, uh, hang on one second, I just need to change. I'm <laughs> just going to change my name. I'm not Flex Global Webinars. I am Karen Roy. Oh, hang on a second. Oh, I think I've worked out what the problem is. My keyboard isn't working. Okay, that will be why. So I'm going to stay Flex Global Webinars for the whole thing. I'm very sorry. I'm actually Karen Roy, um, but that's why I can't put a chat in. So my keyboard's decided to stop communicating. Let's hope this doesn't cause me a major problem. I think I'll be okay. So um, what I wanted to do was to um, talk about the membership. So for those of you who are new, and if you are, this is your first meeting, please put a note in the chat to say that um, it's your first meeting and welcome. Very, very happy to have you here. Um, you will see that um, we are a great group of people. We have a lot of fun um, and um, we even like rocking away to some music. There's a lot of us. So on the, on the TMF reference model group, there's um, uh, 307 active members, 1,377 uh, subscribers. So that's where you keep getting emails um, and updating you and 3,400 people on the LinkedIn group. So an absolutely amazing and brilliant to see how many people are um, uh, first timers. I'm going to ask everybody else who's on the steering committee. If anybody wants to reply to anybody do because clearly I can't because I don't have a keyboard. So if anybody wants to welcome everybody, but I can see there's lots of people who are new. So that's wonderful. Okay, so just a quick, I, I stole this from um, the Clinical Document World um, um, polls. I just really like the fact that we asked a couple of questions. There were a hundred or so people on, on, the, um, on the conference and end of last week. Um, do you use the reference model? 81.1% said yes for all studies. Now this isn't just the reference model community. This is everybody. So that's absolutely brilliant. Yes, for some studies, 10%. We're implementing 5%. Only 2.7% said they had no plans. So, and I have no idea who they were. I tried to find them, but I failed. Um, and then you visited the website. Um, yes, and use some of the deliverables, a whopping 76%. So again, absolutely fantastic that so many people are actually using the website, using the deliverables and making use of everything that we're doing. So without further ado, Joanne, can I hand over to you to talk about version 321, please? Sure. Can you hear me, Karen? Absolutely perfectly, yes. Okay, great. Um, good morning and good afternoon to everyone. Um, if you go to the next slide. <laughs> there does seem to be um, 
some inconsistency with the sub artifacts. So it seems that some sub artifacts are individual documents. So when you look at them, you will see a document name that you are fairly familiar with. Um, in other cases, these seem to be sort of a bucket of um, sub artifacts along with some individual documents um, internally. So I just want to remind everybody that the reference model is truly a model and it should be modified as needed by companies selecting to use the model. So please feel free to select the sub artifacts that apply to your company and you may need to tweak them a little or you may even want to make them very specific um, to make them applicable to your own organization. If you can go to the next slide. Absolutely. There you go. And we are um, releasing version 3.2.1 um, today. And as you can see, many of these changes are just sort of housekeeping, um, fixing some typos or um, removing some things that um, didn't change <laughs> appropriately when we rolled out 3.2.0. Um, for example, in artifact number 1111, the debarment list uh, statement, um, the milestone was updated. Um, and move to 02, clinical infrastructure ready. Um, for the committee process, we removed the strike through, which was inadvertently left in. Um, the monitoring plan, we added the milestone um, for site live. And um, for tracking information in the data management area, 1052, um, we added an X to the county, uh, country, excuse me, um, column. Um, for 2.1.10, which is report of prior investigations, we hadn't spelled out what RPI um, actually stands for. So now that's um, much more clear. And under 2.2.3, um, we had a duplicate of summary of changes that we removed one of those. And finally, under the regulatory authority decision, we um, corrected the wording from condition approval to conditional approval. So um, you will see that uh, hopefully soon. Oh my God. Thank you very much, um, uh, Joanne. Just a quick question, um, which I'm sure, so if anyone's got any questions, feel free to put them in your chat. Um, um, I've discovered that actually my keyboard works in everything apart from Zoom, so I have no idea what's going on. If anybody wants to educate me on how to fix that, feel free. <laughs> but um, Joanne, I, I know I had one question, which was related to the sort of the next version. And and do you do you have any thoughts between as a as a, a change control board when you think sort of the more the 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 change requests that you're getting are going to be included? Is there a timetable, or is it really you're going to see uh, once you've built up a significant amount, then you would look at having a um, a new chain, a new version. Sure, we haven't, we don't have a target date yet. We have received a lot of changes that we're working through right now. So I think what we'd like to do is get through this um, bolus of changes that we've recently received and and see where we land up. No worries at all. Thank you very very much. Okay. Excellent. Okay, so let's move on. So I'm now going to begin to talk about MHRA and the BMO inspection reporting and Kathy is going to take by far the most the most of this in terms of presentation. So Kathy, can I hand over to you please if that's okay to talk about the MHRA inspection reporting. You're on mute Kathy. Hang on, let me see if I can unmute you. Sometimes I need to, I need to, to let me ask you to unmute. Is that gonna work? Hold on one second, one second. Yeah, that, that worked, Karen. Sorry, I could not Excellent. unmute myself. I, I, I have no idea why. Zoom's obviously got a little bit of a bug for me today, but anyway, there you go, over to you. Okay, thanks, uh, Karen. Uh, I think we can go on to the next slide. 
the reason that we're talking about this today is that the MHRA has recently issued something they do periodically, uh, which is a GCP inspection metrics report. And of course, that's always received by this community with some level of interest because these GCP inspections often involve findings that are directly related to TMF. So this report covered the 1st of April, 2018 to the 31st of March, 2019. It sounds like a long time ago, but this is typical for when they publish these reports. They are always quite delayed. I don't know what the exact reason is that it takes so long, uh, but we never have really fresh information there. Uh, but the good thing about it is it really provides excellent insight into MHRA's compliance concerns. So they report on the critical findings they report in some detail, which is what we'll mostly be talking about today. And in this particular edition, there were a number of specific findings that were related to the trial master file that are really quite instructive. Uh, so next, I think, do we have some polling questions, Karen? Absolutely, we do. So let me launch the polls. So I've got all three polls in one, Kathy. So I'm right, going to right. launch them. Um, can you see the questions? Yes. So the, th the three polls that we've got, one is the, have you participated in a health authority inspection in the last year? The second one is, what do you feel is the most important area for inspectors? And the third one is, if you've experienced an inspection, what sh should you have done a better job on? I really liked your third question, Kathy. I thought that was really a good one to ask. We don't normally ask that sort of question. Yeah, and I thought it'd be interesting to get those answers before we review these results to see, you know, for people that haven't looked at them yet, what their perception is and how it matches up with what, what happened in this report. Absolutely. So I can tell you now that we have 173 people on here. So come on, guys. It'll be really good. Last time we got about 80% of the people to vote. Um, so um, if we can, we're on 50% at the moment. So if everyone just goes in, even if it's not applicable, right, not applicable. And I, I've, I've, I, some magic's unjammed my keyboard. So no idea. <laughs> Right, how are we doing at 65%? I'm gonna leave it for one more minute because a lot of people will be thinking about it. Kathy, what do you predict number three is gonna be? Uh, what people should have done a better job on? Yeah. I, uh, what people will probably say is completeness my, is my guess. Oh, do you know what? I just realized if you haven't had an experience, what um, if you had experienced an inspection, what should have done a better job on? We didn't give you a not applicable. I, so I just realized thing, that. Yeah, I realized pick, that too. Pick yeah. the thing that you think you probably should have done a better job on had you had one. Right, okay, we're approaching 80% of votes. Okay, here we go in the polling. And I'm going to share the results. Um, and I'm going to ask um, Paul or Todd, can one of you grab the results, please? I just screenshot it. Thank you. I just picked two names just, uh, just so that I've got the results so I can put them in the slides. Kathy, anything you want to say about those results? Well, let's just take, take a quick review. Yeah, so we had, it looks like um, about 21% of us participated in an inspection last year altogether. And unsurprisingly, in the current climate, 16 of the 16 of the 21% was remote. And uh, the first 5% too might have been at the beginning of last year, uh, before everything kind of uh, went to hell in a handbasket. Uh, then the most important consideration uh, is the ability to reconstruct the trial. And of course that incorporates a lot of these other factors. So I think that makes sense that, uh, the, that the TMF is the tool that you use. And if it's not complete, if it's not high quality, uh, then the ability to reconstruct the trial is, is impacted. And the last one, what should we have done a better job on? Uh, they're, they're not all that far apart, but completeness uh, so my prediction was right, Karen, that completeness did come out on top. Absolutely. Um, 
but then all of these other things are obviously really important. And so I think people felt that their preparation should have encompassed a number of areas that they could do better on in the future. And you know, Kathy, what's interesting, the ability to reconstruct the trial really also comes back to completeness. And we yeah. you know that poll we often do, which is what's more important, quality, timeliness or completeness. It always used to be quality. And I think a lot of people are sort of shifting to completeness because they're going, well, actually, we probably got quite good quality processes in now, but actually it's the, we just don't have half the documents there. So anyway, I will stop sharing and I will go back to the presentation for you. Okay, let's move on to the next slide. A summary of the, the findings. Uh, so we, it focuses heavily on critical uh, findings, but uh, as I'll mention in a moment, it does discuss others as well. So it covered a total of eight sponsor inspections, and out of, out of those, there were seven critical findings across the eight, eight inspections. So some of the sponsors, I think four of them had no critical findings, but uh, there were seven, seven that were critical. And out of those, two of those critical findings specifically related to TMF. Uh, one of the sponsors' TMF findings, by the way, was repeat. So this, is, this sponsor was a repeat offender. They had a major finding the time before, which was uh, a lot of the justification for escalating it to critical. Then in CROs, they had six total critical findings in 11 inspections, and one of those was related to TMF. And the third category was non-commercial entities, and they had three critical findings. One of them was indirectly related to TMF. In other words, it was a finding that was actually classified as data integrity, but there were several specific TMF related findings uh, called out within that. And they do talk about uh, observations beyond critical findings as well, uh, but they don't give us all the details on those. So if you look at the sponsors, uh, all the findings, then record keeping and essential documents was actually the most common area of findings, about 18% of all of the findings for sponsor inspections. Uh, for CROs, it was the largest category tied with monitoring. Uh, and for, not, for uh, non commercial, it was second to quality systems. So, across the board, whether you're looking at critical findings or other findings, uh, TMF and uh, record keeping was way up there as, as something that's important. Kathy, there was a really interesting presentation last week from somebody in QA, I think he was from Griffles, and he was presenting it over the years. And what was fascinating was that ETMF or document record keeping effectively was at the top every single year, apart from one, it was second, but otherwise it was at the top. So it's just like this continuous sort of theme that runs through things. So I thought it was very interesting. Yeah, yeah. that doesn't surprise me. Yeah. So what I did was to take all of the observations, the 33 individual observations related to TMF that were called out in this report, and I assigned them to categories. So these are my categories, they're not MHRA's categories, uh, but to try to understand the trending a bit more. And what you're seeing in front of you is my categorization. And I only included in this graphic things that I saw at least twice. So that's why it doesn't add up to 33. Uh, but using that, was really able to kind of identify the, some of the patterns that were emerging. And unsurprisingly, completeness is the pattern that emerges over and over again. And uh, I'll talk about that a little bit more in a moment. Uh, ancillary systems, which I think um, if you were to go back, I bet Karen to that presentation that was given, that wasn't such a, a big thing a few years ago. And then you see kind of evenly distributed a bunch of things about um, the the functionality of the ETMF, specifically about the ability to reconstruct the trial, uh, the, the quality system and SOPs, so uh, naming conventions. So I'll talk about um, a few of these that I picked out uh, for particular, uh, of, that were of particular interest. I see there's a question about ancillary systems, so I'll actually talk about that in a moment. Uh, can we go on to our next slide, Karen? Our first trend is obviously TMF completeness, and there are numerous observations related to completeness of the TMF. But what I thought was interesting was a lot of them were strategic errors, not just you were missing some documents, but completeness is lacking because the scope of the TMF was not properly defined. It wasn't pro properly defined in the TMF SOP or the, the master index of documents. 
It didn't include all the ancillary systems, the, the other systems that contain TMF content that aren't part of the core TMF. So that was a big problem. So really it goes back to, this is not something you can fix by you know, stuffing more documents in the system. It goes back to how you've defined the TMF in the first place and whether that's been uh, done properly to really encompass all of the documents that are needed to reconstruct the trial and ensure the safety of the, of the patient. So then there were other observations that were a bit more tactical about failing to fire file uh, required documents and lack of oversight in related to completeness. So not doing the right checks to make sure over time that the completeness was there, uh, sort of the, the file review types of things. Next slide, please. So here are the, uh, the famous ancillary systems. So this is the fact that for almost anybody, your documents that, are, that comprise the TMF are not stored in a single system. So there's documents stored in safety systems, in vendor systems, in uh, clinical and trial supply, and in um, data management systems, and, and many other places, which the MHRA has said in the past is acceptable. Uh, they don't want to see you having you know, where they've been asked, you know, how, how many are too many? And I think they said, well, you know, 20 is too many. Can't really say, you know, exactly where that point is. Uh, but the, the point is that they need to be completely defined. The system of record needs to be defined. And then the proper level of control and oversight needs to be applied to all of those systems. So this, again, was a common finding. And as a result, it's, it is tightly coupled with completeness, as, as Karen observed. The, the fact that you haven't properly defined the scope of the TMF uh, obviously uh, would impact the completeness significantly, as well as the details of how those systems are controlled. Uh, next one, please. Naming conventions. So this seems like something that you know, we should kind of be starting to get right by now. Uh, inspectors should be able to rely on consistent naming conventions to identify documents and to understand their contents without having to open them. So pity the poor inspector that is confronted with 55 documents named note to file, right? They have no choice but to open every one of those 55 notes to file if they want to see what's in it. So the, some of the specifics, documents couldn't be located due to file naming conventions inconsistencies. So I once had a, a, a client tell me that they had 10 different ways of naming their protocols. And you can see, I mean, there's only one protocol in the study, so that's probably not such a problem in this case, but for anything else that, where there's a lot of them and they've been named in different ways, you run a search, you do a filter and you don't find all of them. That's a problem. Documents aren't reflect, names aren't reflected of the contents, misnamed documents. So they're just plain names wrong. So any number of things there uh, that, the, that this, this uh, sponsor or CRO probably should have gone back to the drawing board just to see how they're assigning those names, what guidance they've given to their users and their QC people. Next. Shadow TMF. I think uh, many of us have heard this term in the past and we kind of all hoped it was going away, uh, but they had some very specific observations about one company. A shadow TMF is when you have usually a paper TMF and an electronic TMF of some sort that's often not your official TMF. So maybe your, your, your paper TMF is the, is the TMF of record, but you have a bunch of electronic files that um, have been used to construct a working copy of the TMF. And the problem with those is they're almost never kept in sync. And sure enough, they're saying, T paper TMF was used in a document archive rather than a working TMF. Trial team members didn't have access to it, but instead used the shadow TMF, but they didn't have the same documents in them. So clearly that's a huge problem if the team is using something or presenting something that doesn't match the TMF of record. And I think I got one more, Karen, uh, two more. Okay, this one surprised me. So I'm gonna actually read this kind of in detail um, where the MHRA said a number of data files were classified as non-essential and filed, filed outside the TMF, including SAS data listing. So that they're, they're saying that in this inspection finding, but they've said very specifically in the past 
that it doesn't make sense to file anything that's a live data set in the, in the main TMS many times because you can't really properly view or work with it. So I, I was interested about this particular finding and how it didn't seem to match what they've said in the past. So that on the right-hand side, you see something I lifted directly out of one of their presentations in 2016. Uh, but I know I didn't check every presentation they've ever made, but I know they've commented on this several times in the past. Does it even make sense to do that? So I, I don't know what advice to give on that particular topic because um, it seems a bit contradictory. I'll be interested if anyone else has experience in this particular area. No, I'm, I'm, I must admit, Kathy, when, when you sent over your slides, I looked at it and I thought, no, absolutely, it, it's surprising because they've absolutely said if you put them in systems where you can't actually, they're PDFs, you can't, you can't analyze, you, you know, you can't effectively interrogate them. I wonder whether this company didn't say that they were part of the TMF, even though they were in a different system. But that's not yeah, what it says there. And, and of course, it, you can always have the case where one inspector doesn't agree with the, you know, the general guidance or whatever, so. Mm, absolutely. Um, just so you know, Kathy, there's a couple of questions coming in, which I think what we'll do, uh, Lisa's very kindly answering them, but we'll go back to them and just see if there's anything that we need to, because they're sort of reference model um, type questions, as opposed okay. to findings type questions. But yeah, carry on. And then we'll, we'll when yeah. you've finished your piece, we'll go back to the questions. Well, we're very nearly wrapped up. I think if we just go to our, the last slide here. So this is just a brief overview. I would highly recommend that you look at all of these detailed finds and create an action plan as needed in your organization. Uh, and I've put in a, a link to a blog article I did that has some more gory detail if anyone's interested in, in, in delving further. But certainly you should also do that yourself by looking at the, the report. And the link to the report was on the first slide of this section. Uh, and one question, as we were talking it over in the steering committee that we were curious about as we observed, these observations are not really new they're, and they're all definitely pre-COVID. So we have a polling question where we wanna ask you if you think that changes to remote inspections has changed the relevance of this information or if you think it's still probably um, just as relevant as it was before inspections started to go remote. Are, are the inspectors looking for anything different than they, they might've been before? So you've got the questions in front of you. And while we do that, let's have a look, because I know we're quite tight on time today. Um, a comment's coming, which is, a, is, is a, a valid comment. We're talking about the data files just now about um, the data listings versus the SAS data files. And I guess it depends where the data listings, going back to your comment your, or your question, your comment earlier, Kathy, about the, the, um, the binding from the MHRA. And I guess it depends were they just, was it just the list of SAEs that wasn't anywhere in the TMF and they said it had nothing to do with the TMF or was it all the stuff behind the SAEs, you know, all the information flow, et cetera. So, yeah. um, and maybe that was, maybe it, it'd be nice to know a bit more detail probably. Um, yes, so, absolutely. It did mention SAS specifically though, although that could be SAS listings. Most of them that are, would be in there would be transport files, I would think. No, absolutely. So a couple of questions that I want to just run through. Um, one from Emmanuel um, and Kathy, you and I can just answer these ones off between us or if anybody else wants to answer them online. Um, is there a master list of what should be in the TMF? Mm. So Lisa's answered that very nicely with the TMF reference provides a reference for the content, but it doesn't prescribe. And I know Andy Fisher has absolutely said over and over again, you can definitely have whatever list you want, but if it doesn't tell the story of the trial, um, then it, you know, if, if, if your TMF doesn't sell the story of the trial, we'll have a finding. So um, it's not an official um, regu code of regulations. In fact, I don't know, Kathy, what your thoughts are, but ICAG 6R3 is going to change section eight. Um, I, my gut is that they might even remove the listing from the back, but I don't yes, know. Yes, uh, yeah, yeah, That because that listing uh, really confuses people more than it enlightens them, I think. Yeah, I completely agree, completely agree. Um, next question from Brandy is, will, will the reference model ever contains examples of standard naming conventions? We've actually talked about doing like a, um, 
oh, what do we call those one pager things? I can't remember what we called them now. A, 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 a white paper. A white paper. That, thanks, Lisa. Thanks, Lisa. We talked about doing that, didn't we? We talked about doing something and mentioning naming conventions. Did we? Is, is it covered in any of the documents, like all the quality stuff? No, my response to that was it really is dependent on system, right, and process. So it, it, it is difficult to prescribe exactly what the naming conventions would be. So, uh, but we don't, we don't address it anywhere. No, no I think that's the key question is if put yourself in the inspector's shoes. If you were looking at that document, would you have a reasonable understanding of what's in it without having to open it? Mm. Good point, Kate, Kath. Yeah. And I've heard this over and over through the years. I used to work in regulatory and the people that received electronic um, uh, ECTDs said the same thing. They could not stand to get a, a submission that had all these files with the same names where they didn't know what was in them. There is the other school of thought though, which is it's the balancing of the effort, isn't it? Because in the paper world, you'd go to a section and you'd go through three documents and find the one you want. So in an electronic world, whilst it should never be wrong, I think I think there's a balance of effort. I think sometimes people put um, huge amounts of, of into naming conventions and it's so much effort that people then get it wrong or don't bother. So I think there is a balance to be had. Um, right, well, uh, let me just see how we're <laughs> doing for time. Uh, there is a question about when you rename in your master TMF, do you go back and update all the previous documents files to an old name? Kathy, Lisa, either of you want to comment on that? I would be careful of that if you have, you know, if an SOP said, you know, or some sort of document attached to an SOP five years ago said you would find this under this name, that you've retrospectively changed the name and, and no longer comply with that SOP version. But I think you could argue either way. Yeah, and I could argue the other way. Exactly, Kathy. I was just going to say, I think there's a, a there, there's an assessment here because if you can rename to add the sub artifact name, which then gives it a big a bit more granularity, or give the document name, then you're allowing somebody to know what the content is before opening it. So, uh, I uh, I think it depends on the effort needed, the risk. Uh, and the value to it. Um, I always like it to be more granular. But that's so I, unfortunately, I'm going to have to sort of move us on, but just a, I just want to highlight a couple of things. Teresa, totally get your point. You can have a reference model with naming conventions and people don't follow it. And I think everyone's been fighting that fight, as you said. Um, and Barbara, you had a question about data listings being in a different um, a different place and has anyone gone through a finding inspection had a finding using over the shoulder access and I must admit I thought that if something stayed in another system and you use that sort of access my 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 thought process would be that it would be acceptable but if anyone's got any comments on that um that would be great and um I'm actually going to have to just there's too many comments so I'm going to have to move us on I'm going to end the polling so Kathy over to you to just comment quickly on the polling okay oh no I've got to share them first once I've shared them then you can comment now you can comment okay uh 62 percent think that the points are still relevant I thought the points were still relevant uh we have uh Interestingly, three people experienced remote, remote inspection and found the focus has changed. I would love to hear from that 3% uh, because I think their personal experience is a lot more relevant than, than probably some of us theorizing over it. But I think that most people think that, um, that it will remain relevant. Uh, we, and then we have 19% who have experienced remote inspection and found the focus to be similar. So that's also kind of reinforces that. Would like to hear more from the first category if that's possible. Yeah, anybody wants to comment, feel feel free. Okay, so I uh, thank you very much, Kathy. Um, much appreciated. I am literally going to fly through a couple of a couple of slides now. If anyone has any other comments they want, because we're going to move on. And oh, I just lost. Is everybody still there? Um, participants. Yes. Sorry, I just lost my participant list. Um, hopefully you're all still there. Um, 
And I'm going to, if anyone wants to make any more comments, then I will come back to them um, towards the end if we have a bit of time. I just wanted to bring up very quickly um, a summary of the BMO fiscal year 2020 metrics. Um, I think it was quite interesting that um, I, the MHRA seemed to have got their office-based inspections, remote inspections quite um, standard, standard. So people, a lot of people had experienced them before the pandemic. So whilst I remember um, Andy Fisher saying that he was going to, they were going to be going back to, to in-person inspections at one stage. They clearly, oh, I've got my camera on. They clearly um, uh, changed their mind, changed their mind about, about that and stayed remote. Um, the FDA did something called remote regulatory assessments, voluntary remote evaluations of data and processes via video conference and remote record review as an alternative to an inspection. Um, and that was with a site of interest. So I, I, I think they obviously adjusted to how they were working. Um, and um, you can see from this chart that there was very little done in 2020 in compared to 20, well, 2018 and 2019. Um, and the RRAs aren't on here, but there was a chart available which showed the RRAs um, now, I know when we were talking at the conference last week, there were a couple of people who were told they were going to go through RRAs and then they ended up getting cancelled. And also a couple of people whose sites they wanted to actually get. In fact, I know of two people where the site, they wanted the sites to photocopy all the documents and send them to the inspectors or take them to a remote place. And obviously part of the challenge with the sites were actually in Europe and then GDPR says you can't move the documents, etc. And for both of them, it actually... Um, they, they eventually cancelled their, their um, request for the documentation. So just a little bit of insight into the US. Um, I am, there's, there's a lot of comments going on in the chat, which is fantastic. So feel free to keep chatting there. Um, one of the, uh, looking through all the observations that were found, um, there wasn't anywhere near as much about TMF. We know that the FDA takes a slightly, well, sometimes takes a slightly different view in terms of TMF and how they approach the TMF. Um, but they did have some findings about inadequate records, accountability statements, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and, uh, and I'm sure there's going to be a massive catch up. In fact, I think Emmanuel, you've just said that um, they, they are with, all, with everything they're inspecting at the moment, obviously TMF is very, very, very critical. And we did a presentation at the beginning of last year when the pandemic happened, we said, what's the impact of, of COVID? And it's TMF still has still is important regardless of what's going on. So without further ado, I'm actually going to switch tack now and I'm going to hand over to Ken, Elvin and Paul for the last set part of the session to talk about the exchange mechanism standard survey results. So I don't know who's first, but I have the slides. And if anybody needs me to um, unmute them, then I can see Paul, you can speak. Who's this, going this, is, this is Ken. Hey, Ken. Yeah. OK, I guess you can hear me. I can. Absolutely. <laughs> All right. Thanks, Karen. Yeah, I'll be introducing the presentation and Elvin will be talking about uh, some of the results and some of the observations that we've made to this point about the uh, the survey, and Paul will be concluding the presentation uh, talking about uh, some proposed initiatives for, for moving ahead. Perfect. Uh, next slide, please. Okay, I'll just do a brief uh, overview of the exchange mechanism standard. It's a, a common approach for exchanging documents between systems and organizations. Uh, it's open to any stakeholder who wishes to uh, adopt the specification and implement it in their organizations. Uh, its benefits uh, include saving time to uh, set up the document exchanges. And this helps, uh, this helps to, uh, to uh, run more uh, frequent exchanges uh, between systems to keep the TMF current. Now, our purpose in doing the survey was to identify use cases that were most critical to various stakeholders and to identify opportunities where we can collaborate to advance the standard uh, for wider adoption throughout the industry. Next slide. We emailed invitations to the subscriber list for the TMF reference model. 
I apologize to anyone who did not receive one of these emails because we understand we had some technical problems. Uh, we also posted announcements to various LinkedIn groups, including the TMF reference model and the TMF exchange mechanism. The questionnaire was online for four months. Uh, we just closed it over a week ago. Next slide. We asked the respondents information about uh, their roles in their organizations uh, and their relationship to the TMF uh, function, and uh, as, as well as their understanding of the exchange mechanism standard. They could select up to three use cases. We had eight listed, and we had an option to enter a use case if there was one there that was a particular interest that was not uh, listed. And we asked the uh, respondents to talk about their plans to implement these use cases and any barriers that they might be encountering. And then very importantly, we asked them what value their organizations would perceive in implementing each of the use cases they selected. Next slide. Next slide. Oh, not that one. <laughs> okay. And uh, we want to thank everyone who participated. There were 138. Uh, uh, over half were uh, sponsors, oh, excuse me, not quite over half, but uh, mostly sponsors, CROs, and of course, uh, uh, quite a few ETMF vendors. Uh, it was good to see representation from some of these other areas as well. So at this point, I'll pass this on to Elvin, who will talk about some of the results we've seen and observations we've made. Elvin. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, thank you. Can um, yeah. So what I'll do is to very high level. Uh, we'll have a much more detailed one later, and Paul will get into that. So, but one of the things that we found interesting is still um, we've probably done a better job of um, sending out the survey than actually getting people trained in some sense. So we need to do more about that because, uh, especially on what we call the customers, which which we sponsors and CROs, um, we saw that uh, over. 20, uh, close to 25% uh, uh, of the total um, were, didn't, were not familiar with the uh, exchange mechanism. Um, and a 5% of that also was the provider. So close to 30% were not familiar. So there's definitely more uh, education from our side to be done on that. And we'll follow up on that. Um, and so there's also, in, in the end, the knowledge of it was, fairly low. And again, it points to the same direction that we need to do more with that. And then I'll go to the next slide. Okay, next slide. Yeah, um, one, yeah, there. And probably most people, even if you took it, didn't know that. But the, the way it was broken down was we had uh, other use cases, which were given to um, what we call customers, which are CRO and sponsors. Or we used solution types, and that's what the vendors and other provider types would um, would give to people. So, so these are the solutions that are available. So, in the end, the, the use case that was the most um, interesting from from the sponsors and customers, as we call them, were to transfer the final TMF from CRO to sponsor, and then the second in line would be the archive one. And, but instead of going through them in detail here, we can go to the next slide, which actually tells something about how they interact. And I know this is a little busy. What you see on the left side is all the use cases uh, based on the question number they had. And then on the top, you see the uh, solution type. <clears throat> and what we have done here is actually each use case relates to a solution type. A solution type is, is fundamentally a way that this uh, use case would be implemented. And um, what you actually see here is that the, the, the one that, the use case that most want um, from a business point of view was what we said before, transfer the final one, so number 16. And, and out of that, you see the solution types that uh, sponsors provide. It's actually the lowest 37 in this case. So out of the, providers, only 37 had responded that they offered that solution type, meaning in this case, a batch for a final transfer. Um, 
And if you just hear last, Karen, just could you click again? I think there are just to highlight one more time and that should be the last. And what you see here is that there is a, a sort of a very clear difference here that if you total up the number of answers that was for um, a use case that needed a solution type, there are 75 answers which were close to half or over half of all what the customers want would fall into a batch solution, whereas that's from a provider point of view, the least interesting. And we will go in much more detail into that later, but those are just some of the key findings we have here. Um, and, and it's just showing that there is sort of a discrepancy between what possibly customers want and what actually vendors are currently wanting to deliver or can deliver. And with that, I'll hand over to Paul. Great, thanks, uh, Ken and Elvin. Um, so yeah, this this survey definitely has been a labor of love. It's, it's taken us quite a long time to put in place. Um, and it's something that's fairly complex, but I think we've got some really interesting results. So th these are really just some preliminary conclusions that we've drawn from the, the results that we got. Um, and we will be doing a more in-depth analysis over the next month. Um, but what we, we saw was that the majority of respondents um, were aware uh, or were familiar with the EMS. So even though we need to do more training, um, you know, the, the community does know that it, that it exists and that it's around. Um, almost half of sponsors and CROs indicated that they didn't know how to implement it. So this is what Elvin was talking about, where we need to sort of think about training and, and how can we sort of communicate to people how best to use this standard that's been developed. 56% of respondents didn't know if they were going to implement um, the exchange mechanism standard, so the decisions have still not been made. Um, uh, and then 34.8% um, had a plan to implement the, 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 the standard, so that's encouraging. So just over a third of, of the respondents um, were planning to implement this at some point in the future. When it came to vendors, 35% um, indicated that the customers we're just not asking them for the EMS, um, which is kind of interesting. And then 31% of the vendors indicated that they didn't know how to develop it. They didn't know how to put this in place in their system for their customers. So again, I think it, it comes to down to, to education there. Um, and so I think that, you know, we'll, we'll see some of the actions that we're planning, but part of it is education. Um, it, it's also imperative, I think, that the sponsors and CRO take more ownership of the model obviously it's been developed for them to benefit them um, and they need to work more with the vendors to get it implemented um, what's also interesting is, is when we asked the vendors what you know the, whether they felt um, that the ems would actually bring value to their clients um, 90 over 90 percent of them felt that it would um, and that it would also give them a competitive edge as a vendor and so i think that you know, the vendors see the value and, and you know, they want to implement it, but it needs to be driven by customer demand. Um, next uh, slide. And then, you know, obviously an important part of this survey was to understand the value of the different use cases that it can be used for, so that we know how to kind of move forward with the next uh, iteration of, of the standard. Um, and so, uh, as Elvin had alluded to earlier, um, you know, the, the most popular um, use case is the final transfer of TMF um, from CRA to sponsor. And this was kind of the first use case that we really um, addressed with the, uh, the standard. This was the initial focus. Um, so 64.5% of respondents said that that would be the most uh, uh, of most interest to them. Um, over half um, are interested in using it for archiving, um, which is actually quite interesting. Um, I know that archiving obviously is a, is a big challenge nowadays with the whole 25 year rule. Um, and so um, it's something I think we should look into uh, in more detail. And then also the, the majority of vendors uh, today provide extracts to sponsors. Um, so they're, they're, they're basically transferring files and listings of data. Um, and only 34% of um, sponsors use their ETMF to archive content. So, uh, you know, three quarters of sponsors are putting it somewhere else. I'm not sure where, um, but that definitely, you know, is a challenge that, that maybe this standard can help uh, to, to address. 
Um, 64% of vendor respondents felt that the EMS could be a useful standard for archiving of the, of the ETMF. So they see the value. And then the last thing that I thought was quite interesting was in relation to sponsor site interaction. So obviously, um, you know, the, the, the TMF itself is sponsor plus site. It's not just sponsor. Um, and there is a lot of exchange going on between sponsors and sites. And so a third of respondents were interested in potentially using this standard to facilitate those exchanges. Um, and it's also interesting to see that sort of portals now between sponsors and sites are starting to emerge. And a third of respondents are actually already using a portal uh, to transfer content. So it's, you know, the technology is there as well to make this feasible. Next slide. And I'm gonna try and speed up a little bit because I know that Karen's got other things to present as well. So from this, we, we, drew, um, we drew a list of actions and initi initiatives that we, th we thought we should uh, implement moving forward. So the first is um, to try and involve decision makers from, from companies uh, and to, um, to, to improve buy-in. You know, basically we were asking who were the decision makers uh, and quite often it was the leadership of the, the different companies that were responsible for making decisions. So we need to get those people involved uh, in, the, um, in the, uh, the activities. Uh, we also want to restart the working groups to educate um, people and also to strategize on their implementation. And we, we, we decided that we would also, um, as part of the outputs from those working groups, start to prepare uh, integrated implementation guides for sponsors, CROs and vendors on each of the different um, use cases that we're covering. So make, make them really use case specific. We also want to set up a working group to define a clear set of requirements that can be used for implementing this within organizations and within systems by all stakeholders. Um, so we're gonna probably evaluate the top five, maybe it'll be the top four, we haven't quite decided yet. Um, use cases and then um, you know, define an action plan for reviewing the standard based on those use cases to make sure the standards can, can actually handle those use cases. And then we'll also assign business and vendor leads for each use case group um, to work on those, those guides and, and really sort of drive things forward. So very similar to what we do today with the zone leads uh, in the reference model. Next slide. So this is how we, are, we see our roadmap moving forward. Um, so first of all, um, we have the current specification that's out there. Um, there are some companies that have started to implement it, which is great, um, but we need, we need better adoption. We need uh, the industry really to sort of take this uh, by the horns and put it in place. So the first thing that we need to do is we need to start to get more engagement from sponsor and CRO leadership, and also from the vendor leadership. Um, so we want to, to really sort of start to, to build um, almost a committee of, of leaders um, who can drive this standard forward. We also then will have our different working groups um, once we've established um, the, 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 uh, the leadership board. Um, and these working groups, as I said, will focus on the different use cases. From those working groups, we'll have two different outputs or two different deliverables. We'll have the implementation guides and requirements, um, which are specific to each use case. And then we'll also have um, an updated uh, specification. So we'll do the next version, which will integrate additional metadata and additional requirements for some of these use cases. Um, and the goal here is, is really to sort of engage the industry, get something that's really usable, get everybody educated and understanding what this is all about. Um, and then you know, obviously get this deployed in the solutions that are out there and start using it as an industry. That's, that's really important. Next slide. So our next steps, um, we will be distributing the full survey results towards the end of March. Um, and we'll also um, be putting together a webinar where we'll, we'll present a detailed analysis of all of the results that we've got. Uh, and of course, you'll all be invited to, to participate in that webinar. Um, and then finally, we'll also reach out to start forming the leadership committee and the working groups. And so with that in mind, we'd like to do a poll um, just to finish up. Um, and the, the goal of this poll is to, 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 to measure interest from everybody that's online today. Um, but also remember that we're looking for, for volunteers here. So if you answer the, the poll, we may actually uh, reach out to you and ask if you want to participate in, in, in either a working group or in the leadership committee. 
Um, so if you don't want to do either of those, or if you don't want us to reach out, then obviously don't answer the poll. So we'll give you a, a few seconds. And just to say, Paul, that all the other polls are anonymous. I made this one non-anonymous. Thank you. Otherwise, you wouldn't <laughs> And that's why I wanted to make sure that the disclaimer was out there because obviously, you know, the, we're, yeah. we're going to get your information, so we'll be uh, we'll be cons conscripting you. Of course, I've now got to figure out how on earth I find out where the names are, but I'll figure ah, that out. Okay. okay. <laughs> There's a question I see in the chat there, and I, you can maybe answer that while we're waiting. Absolutely. So there's some a little confusion. They say on the what would the base system uh, used when doing this type of transfer, and and what it is, is this is very similar to what the ECTD is, which is a standard XML we are creating today. So the base system, the one creating it, is basically creating a file, a standard file, that then any other system should be able to consume afterwards. So I hope that's answering that question. Yeah, and it could be ETMF to ETMF, or it could be yeah. another system to ETMF or ETMF to another system. Okay, I'm gonna end the polling. Okay. And share the results. Did we get a lot? Okay. Well, Amazing. It, that's cool. You've got 29 people who are interested. Yeah. So now I'll try and figure out who those 29 people are. All right, thank are, you, Karen. I'll come okay. back to you. <laughs> <laughs> that's amazing. Thank you. Thank you, everybody. Uh, got, Paul, thank remind, you. remind me, remind me. Anyway, will, let's- I'll, I'll, I'll send you an email. I'm sure you will. Uh, right, so that's absolutely perfect timing. Thank you very, very much. Can I just say one thing? This is recorded. It will be, oh, hang on. Let me just put my camera on so I'm not, you're not talking to a, a blank person. This is recorded. It will be available. Um, and it will be available on the website as soon as Eldon very kindly tops and tails and I'll leave the, the music going as well on it. Um, and um, the slides are on there as well. The slides will also be posted up separately. Um, just a quick comment, there are some TMF related events coming up. Um, so those of you who attended the Clinical Document World, there's an inspection readiness one um, in May. There's the HSRAA, which is the, um, uh, it's the archiving organization. I can't remember what it all stands for, um, um, but that's a, that's a really good conference. And that's gonna be in September, around September, 2021. Fierce TMF Summit is theory theoretically in person in October 2021, and the Clinical Document World in New Jersey is in November 2021. So fingers crossed that at some stage this year, we can see each other, which will be very nice. Um, and then the next meeting is on the 19th of April. Thank you very much, Russell. It's the Health Science Record and Archive Association. I couldn't remember on the spot. Um, so if you want the link, it's, it's in there. Um, and um, uh, the, so the next meeting is on the 19th of April. Um, Jana, you've, you've raised a point about needing help with medical devices. There is going to be some medical device um, input um, into the reference model. Um, and I can, if you, I can try and connect you with the person who's running that, if that would help you at all. Um, uh, and Janet, just get in touch somehow because I don't know your email address. So um, either, well, just put your email address or email me kroy at flexglobal.com and I'll connect you somehow. So without further ado, it's dead on five. I am impressed when I saw all the slides of the content, I thought there was absolutely no way on earth we were ever going to finish this all within an hour and we've done it, which is very impressive. So thank you very much, everybody. And um, take care and look after yourself. And it was very good. Thank you very, everybody who's taken part. Thanks, uh, Karen. Thanks. And we're going thank out you. to Toto again. <laughs>